Hello, everyone, and welcome to Julia Computing's webinar, an introduction to Julia Sim. Thanks for joining us today. I'm Misha St. Amand, the head of marketing for Julia Compu Computing. Um, today's webinar is being presented by Dr. Chris Rakakis, the director of modeling and simulation at Julia Computing, and the creator, lead developer of Julia Sim. His software and research are focused on scientific machine learning, SciML, which is the integration of domain models with artificial intelligent techniques like machine learning. We're also joined today by Anas Abdelrahim, who will be helping answer your submitted questions. Anas is the team lead for surrogates at Julia Computing. He has a degree in nuclear engineering and has worked with the WHO, OPG, and the Government of Canada, applying AI to real world engineering applications. Thank you all for joining us today. Dr. Rakakis, I'll let you get things started. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. So yeah, I'm you know, Chris Rakakis, I'm the Director of Modeling and Simulation, and today what I'm going to be talking to you about is Julia Sim. So what is Julia Sim? What can you use it for? How does it integrate with the rest of Julia and the rest of the modeling packages that you might already be using? Um, so, so first of all, just the highest level overview, uh, Julia Sim is a cloud-based simulation platform which brings in the latest techniques in scientific machine learning and equation-based digital twin modeling um, to make it so that way it's very easy to do very large-scale high-performance computing on very you know, large numbers of cores. And this is built on the Julia Hub Cloud Compute Platform, which is a platform on AWS and other uh, cloud, cloud compute uh, structures. So that way you can you know, scale your application to the essentially infinite amount of compute that's available on these cloud systems. Um, so I'm gonna be going into a bunch more details, but this is, this is the big overview. It's, it's about bringing scientific machine learning to a very large scale parallel compute platform and making it easy to get this high performance uh, for these very large scale cases. Um, so why do we want Julia Sim? You know, what's the motivation here for, for especially for industry? Um, the reason is because the, the development of new products takes a very long time, right? And when I'm talking about products here, I'm talking about these real world uh, products like HVAC systems, right? And HVAC systems, uh, new batteries for, for cars, new, new engines, um, electric vehicles, all these things take a whole lot of time to develop. And what we're trying to do with Julia Sim is make it so that way we can have more accurate models models of what will happen in reality and make more accurate models from data so that way more of this can happen at the product design stage so that way you can test two prototypes instead of 50 in the field. Um, and, and you know there are a lot of cases that a lot, a lot of companies that we're working with. So for example, with Mitsubishi Electric, it can take six months to test a new HVAC system in, in the test chambers. If we can bring that down to just two prototypes instead of you know, 10, then that completely changes the rate at which we can develop new products, get new th things out there. And then it's a beneficial uh, relationship to the two of us because it, you know, it improves the speed at which your, your company is iterating and also you know, we, we have a benefit as well. So what we are essentially trying to do is use scientific machine learning powered um, modeling and simulation to cut down the design time and make it so that way more happens on the computer and less has to happen in the field. And Julia Sim is then doing this as part of the Julia, uh, Julia Computing and Julia Hub uh, cloud system. So, you know, Julia is the open source modeling, um, uh, open source language. It has over a million users with thousands of packages. Julia Hub is a cloud compute platform uh, which uses the Julia programming language for a lot of its for a lot of its compute, and on top of Julia Hub, we have these these verticals like Pumas for pharmaceutical simulation, uh, Cedar for circuit simulation, and today we're going to be talking about Julia Sim, which is all focused on the physical simulation. These other ones, if you're interested, have their own webinars, and so you can go find all those materials elsewhere in the Julia computing space. Uh, but here, let's focus directly on Julia Sim. So what, what is it all about? So here I'm, I'm putting up a full list of the different modules of Julia Sim, all of the different things we can, it can do. And you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big list, it'll take a bit to go through it, but this is what we'll go through in, in this hour, right? So you know, Julia Sim comes with modeling tools to make it easier to build models. It has model libraries to get started uh, so that way you don't have to get started from scratch. It has modules that enhance what you can do with a model and it has applications or apps which make it so that way it's very easy to just point and click um, and do some very standard analyses on, on these models. So let's 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 dive into first like the, the high level and the philosophy of, of, of Julia Sim, right? 
Um, what, what we're doing is we're building a, a causal modeling system along with the analysis tools for that modeling system that makes it possible to take two discrete models and compose them together, but then be able to run that composed model on a cloud compute system and mix it with machine learning to be able to get more acceleration. So these are the pieces, composable modeling, uh, cloud-based systems for automated scaling to high core counts and mixing that with machine learning based techniques and the scientific machine learning techniques that we've been developing throughout the Julie ecosystem. Um, at, and so basically what, what we have are different tools for, for helping one at different levels or different stages of the modeling process. So for example, if you're in the process where you don't have a model and you need to build a model, Julia Sim has pre-made model libraries that help get you started and also modeling uh, graphical user interfaces that make it so that way someone without as much programming knowledge can just kind of point and click and build up a composed a causal model. Um, if you have data but no models and you want to generate a model from that, we have the digital twin generator. We have cases where, you know, if you have models but no data, you can do things like want to accelerate the model, you can uh, want to build controllers for it, you can want to uh, generate code for embedded systems, right, and if you have models and data, then you also, well, you want to make sure that your model fits your data, and we have tools for that as well. So in all these cases of model, yes, no, data, yes, no, there are tools that we that we give as part of Julia Sim for helping one get to that end point of having a calibrated model against a data set that is then predictive of the physics for, for new parameters. Um, so, and I'll also get into the fact that Julia Sim has tools for using it without coding, right? So there is a full coding based interface for a lot of these tools that allows one go, to go into depth, but there's also variants of these tools like the, uh, like the digital twin generator and the FMU accelerator that are point and click GUIs. So that way you can just kind of upload a data set, upload a model and get a faster version out without having to learn all of the details of the coding environment, right? We're really targeting, um, you know, experienced engineers that want to have full performance and engineers who want to get you know, who want to do you know ha have to learn as little as they need to about the tool but still get a lot out of benefit out of it right these are two different users but they they, they both show up in this industrial use case and we have different parts of julia sim that are tailored to these two different groups um, so let me go a little bit into the philosophy of julia sim before going into each of the specific modules um, so what we're doing with Julia Sim is we are building a tool that integrates with the Julia community, um, but empowers industries to use high level, these high level tools with the state of the art methods um, and mixing that with cloud parallelism, right? So what I mean by integrating with the Julia community is that these tools are built on top of the open source ecosystem. Um, the reason is because we know that the Julia open source ecosystem is very advanced in a lot of its equation solvers, its automated model discovery tools and everything, right? So it, everything with Julia Sim benefits from this rapid advancement. It also means that we have a tight connection with the Julia community. Right? A lot of our developers are the lead developers of some of the major uh, open source packages throughout the ecosystem. But one of the main differences of Julia Sim to the open source ecosystem is that the open source ecosystem is made for you know, researchers who want the most flexibility and want to see every bit of code and be able to change it from themselves, right? be able to create new methods and everything. Julia Sim is now is really focused on the industrial use case of you know, someone who wants to make use of machine learning, but it does not necessarily want to read, you know, 20 machine learning papers to understand, you know, and read through 10,000 lines of code. You know, there, there's, there's someone who wants to use all of these methods without having to understand all the details, but just get the results, right? And this is what Julia Sim is all about. How do we take what's what we have built with the with you know that has all this flexibility in in the open source space and make it so that way we can have graphical user interfaces heuristics and and put this all in, in a in a web app so that way someone can very easily just point and click and get you know the automated discovery of missing physics in their models right it's all about this making it as simple as possible for end users and with that we're also doing this on a cloud 
ecosystem. So that way, you know, you don't need to worry about, you know, whether you can try to set this up with a new cluster or, or you know, all the details of putting together parallelism yourself. It is by default made in a way that we know is efficient on a highly scalable architecture. So that way it really just does achieve that point and click automation. So Julia Sim is about working with this open source ecosystem that we have and making it so that way it's very easy for a someone who's is you know interested in their application domain to go and use it for their application domain um, with, with very few steps but also get that uh, also get that efficiency out of it. And Julia, Julius, and Julia Sim is driving innovation across many industries. We've seen a lot of adoption. Uh, you know, it's it's still a very young stage project a product, um, but we've seen a lot of adoption already from a very wide uh, group of groups, um, especially in cases like pharmacometrics, where you know people have new models that they're bringing into the system, and they're seeing a lot of these performance advantages. As I go through the rest of this talk, I will I will highlight some of these as um, as they come up. So let's go into the first part of our discussion of the different modules of Julia Sim, and let's look at some of the modeling tools, right? So the modeling tools are the tools, remember, that are used for accelerating how you can actually build a model, right? And so, you know, if, if we want to have, basically, if we want to have models and we want to connect them to data and we want to then have a predictive model in the end, the first thing is, well, how do you get a model? And Julia Sim, you know, does not have a its own separate modeling system. Instead, what it does is it once again it integrates with the Julia community, right? So, for example, it, it, you know, if you have models that are written for differential equations like JL, then you already have models that are ready to be used with uh, with Julia Sim. If you have models that are written with modeling toolkit.jl, then you already have models that are ready to be used with the modules of Julia Sim. So these these two pieces, these these two open source pieces. Uh, differential equations.jl and modeling toolkit.jl. These are the modeling formats that we use for all of the, of the uh, Julia Sim pieces, right? So if you're already using them, great. You're ready to use Julia Sim today. If you haven't used them yet, well, the, these two pieces are open source. So you can go out there, read the documentation, and you can build models today, even if you don't have Julia Sim. So, you know, getting, getting everything into the format that is in ready for Julia Sim acceleration and analyses is uh, straightforward, simple, and and right out there for everyone to use. Um, now, there's different pieces that we're building on top of this. So, for example, so I want to highlight here that parts of what I'm what I'm what I'm describing are also part of the roadmap. Um, the Julius and Modeler GUI is one of these pieces that's a bit further on the roadmap, um, and so this GUI is not released yet, but. Essentially, what we're, what we have with the Julius and Modeler GUI is we're building something where you can you know take the a causal models defined by uh, a causal models and a causal components defined for modeling toolkit and in a point and click manner be able to use that to generate the composed model right so if, if you if you know other a causal modeling environments uh, this is a similar GUI but built on top of the Julia open source tools and able to generate modeling toolkit code that you can then analyze using your Julia codes that as well so this this is like a helper for using these open source tools um, Catalyst.jl is, is a specific tool that is for chemical reaction modeling. Once again, this, this one is open, but if you want to you know, build this in a point and click fashion, we have a GUI that we're developing on top of Catalyst, which makes it so that way it's very easy to use a visual algebra to represent a chemical reaction network and generate the, the model that is associated with that and generate the, the simulation associated with it. So that's how models are able to be developed and enhanced with, uh, with Julia Sim, right? I want to highlight that it really is, you know, the, the model input formats for all of Julia Sim is just the open source tools, but we also have now developed some GUIs that are make it easier to, to build models in a no code or low code fashion. Um, but let's say you, you want to have some models, but you don't necessarily, you know, you, you want to have basically have a jump start, right? So for be, to be able to get jump started, we have a bunch of model libraries. So this is this is the aspect of well, you know, you want to do some modeling, but you want someone to help you get started. Um, one one case of this is the modeling toolkit standard library. This comes with modeling toolkit, so you can today you can go out there, um, you can you can start using the modeling toolkit standard library to be able to build models. These components are out there. There's mechanical components. Me magnetic components, thermal components, and many other basic blocks that you can use as, as, the, as 
built uh, as pieces for a basic model, right? So this one is out there, but um, we also have some proprietary modeling tools for specific domains that have found major interest in, in, uh, in Julia Sim. So for example, the Julia Sim HVAC library is a fully developed accurate HVAC library for building these kinds of you know, heat, uh, heat compressors, vapor, vapor compressor cycles, um, uh, modeling with different refrigerant properties, uh, build, uh, doing building, uh, doing building full building models, and making it so that way you can get, do all this type of modeling without having to build your model from the ground. Right, so it has a lot of these, you know, reference properties and everything built directly into the system. So that way, it's very easy and very quick to get a very um, good version of a HVAC system model. Uh, there's been a lot of time that's been spent on making sure that. The refrigerant properties are developed in such a way that you get a very stable simulation that it improves the numerical stability and also improves the, the performance that one gets from the simulation. Um, we also have a full full circuit library, right? So you can it, you can import models from Spice and Spectre Netlist. So that way, let's say you have a specification of some embedded microcontroller and you want to mix that with some physical system, you can use the standard uh, in, you, the standard file formats that someone from say an electrical engineering background would write their 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 model in and you can directly import that into then the modeling toolkit system so that way you can connect it with models you already have right so you can this makes it very easy to then take these these mechanical models and combine them with models of these you know mechanical chips and such that might be uh, associated with it within the, uh, a device we see that this is actually something that's becoming up quite often these these days in cases like electrical cars because you know microchips are prevalent in all physical systems these days. Um, we have the Julius and battery library which is which is currently in development which is targeting the some of these different areas like dual foil Newman and and uh, and different and uh, proton exchange membrane models so being able to model the battery dynamics um, in in terms of the the usage and degradation for cases like electrical vehicles um, and so uh, we, we, there, this this piece is still a bit in development but we'll be giving more information on this uh, a bit later um, we have the Julius Sim uh, rigid body library, which is about developing models of rigid body systems, such as UAVs and, and, um, and robotic systems. And so it gives these pre-made components for making it easy to develop such a rigid body model and then be able to fuse that with the other tools, right? So be able to fuse a rigid body model with a battery model and fuse it with all the models that have been developed with modeling toolkit. I want to I want to highlight that these are component libraries on modeling toolkit so they can automatically compose with anything that's already written in modeling toolkit. So if you have a model that, that's partially ready and you want to add a rigid body system to it, you know, this, this library is able to then compose with that to be able to generate the, the, the combined model. So once you have a model, what can you do with the model in, in Julia Sim, right? This, this is what the, the modules of Julia Sim is all about. So here I want to highlight that, you know, now we talked about, you know, we, we have models, but what can we do with the models? That's this functionality over here, the modules of Julia Sim. And the first module is the Julia Sim digital twin generator. This is, this is a case where if you have data uh, for some components, let's say you have data from some ground sensor, um, and you want to use that to be able to generate some missing part of, of, of the you know, missing mechanical parts. Say, you know, you have some sensor for, for how some robotic arm is supposed to be working, but you don't have a model of that robotic arm yet. Um, the digital twin generator is a way to be able to generate a, you know, a, a, a causal model for or components for that specific part of the system. This one is still a bit in, in development, but the, the goal in the end here is to give these modeling toolkit components so that way you can then connect them to your other pieces, right? So it, it bridges that gap. So it makes it very easy so that way data can become physical models. Uh, the surrogate generator is a module that is all about taking these very big models that you've now built, right? You know, these models that have these, you know, microchips and, and, and batteries and rigid body systems, engines, you know, the, your whole electrical vehicle and making it so that way it's easy to run that a lot faster. And the way that we do this is we train AI equivalents or neural networks to be able to predict how this model will react at new parameters. And when, when this is trained, then that makes it easy to do things like model calibration, 
um, and mo different model analyses, global sensitivities analyses and such. It makes it very easy to do these model analyses on the faster version where the faster version is sufficiently close and sufficiently accurate to uh, the original specification. Um, I'm going to dig into detail on the surrogate trainer in, in a little bit, but just this is just to kind of give a high level highlight of it and we'll, we'll go into some specifics about how this has been used um, and how we and the kinds of speed ups that we've seen through the surrogate trainer. Oh, and 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 uh, yeah so 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 uh, let, let, let's dig into that um, so so the, you know if on. Um, I remember that I mentioned that we have a bunch of different circuit models that are available. Um, we, we have used a surrogate trainer on these surrogate models to kind of to see how much of a speed up that you get. So, for example, on the Sky 130 inverter, the Sky 132 input model, on a, on a digital analog converter, and some circuits that come from quantum computing centers, where we've been able to see that we get about 100x a performance improvement in these types of uh, circuit models with, with the, with the um, surrogate generator. Um, now, with the, the, you know, that's all looking at circuit models. When we look at a broader range of applications, we see fairly similar results. So, for example, on an HVAC vapor compressor system of about 8,000 equations, we saw a 570x acceleration against uh, the, a Daimola-based model. Um, on a building design uh, model, uh, that's not supposed to be 60 equations. That should be um, that should be uh, 12,000 equations. Um, that that saw about 340x acceleration for a global optimization process on a power grid model. We saw a, a, a um, 38 times acceleration, and on a systems pharmacology model of about 200 equations, we saw a 56 times acceleration. Uh, so you know the the different accelerations that you can get for uh, depends on model size, model complexity, you know domain of the model. It depends on many different things, but we see a uh, we do see a fairly strong acceleration in every case that we put it to. And if you're interested, each of these results are in peer reviewed studies, and so we can send those to you um, if if you're interested. Um, there was a case that we looked at, which was a scalable building model with 100,000 equations, which got, an, uh, which got an ADX acceleration. So this highlights, for example, that you know, the Julia Sim tools for modeling are A, able to scale to 100,000 equation models, but B, also the, the surrogate training framework is able to scale to such large scale models. Um, so this is really what we're targeting with this cloud compute system, you know, something that can handle very large scale models and turn them from something that is takes a very long time to something that takes a very, very short time. And, and one of the key highlights about this, this system and the reason why it's built in the cloud compute manner is that we're using surrogate architectures that are specifically designed to be um, to, to be embarrassingly parallel in their training strategy. So for example, these simulations can be done independently on many different cores, and then we can combine them together in a, in a surrogate. Um, it, it, and what that allows us to do is, for example, even though it might take, say, 100 simulations of your model to be able to build such a surrogate, we're able to run all those 100 simulations at the same time. So the real world case does not take as long as 100 simulations, right? The real world case might only take you know, the time it takes to do five runs. But, you know, in the time it takes to do five runs, you will see your model now run 100 times faster. And so the real world speed up is pretty nice for, for a lot of applications, right? And so this is really targeting and focused on, on the case where, you know, if you want to finish your analysis as quickly as possible, this is a very good way to be able to make use of the, you know, the parallelism that is available in a cloud compute architecture or a cloud compute system. Uh, the Julia Sim model optimizer is then a module that is more focused on the case where you have model and data and you want to make the two align, right? So for example, if you want to do model calibration, so you want to make your data align to multiple data sets simultaneously, and you want to do this fitting in a way that is you know, parallelized and also uh, does uncertainty quantification. So for example, you know, questions like find all of the reasonable um, global, op global optimal parameters, right? The Julius and model optimizer makes it easy to do such model calibration tasks, but also it, it's able to do a SIML type of model calibration task, which is what we call model autocomplete, or which you might've heard of as the uh, universal difference equations. Right, so it's able to do a version of the of the uh, model calibration where we say, you know, 
here is the data that we have for, for this model. What needs to be changed about the model in order to be able to accurately fit such data, right? And, and so it's able to put in neural networks into this training process and then be able to run a symbolic regression to be able to predict what might be missing from your A-causal models. Um, so the Juliusin model optimizer is then a module that's all about the different cases of I have data, I have model, but I want to either extend the model or I want to find out how, what needs to be done to make it fit, right? And it really, it really optimizes this process and makes it efficient. Now, I do want to highlight here that, you know, the, the Juliusin model optimizer, you know, we've, you know, the Julia ecosystem itself is well known for its, you know, its SIML techniques and, and these uh, optimization tools. So, you know, what does the Julius model optimizer give over those tools, right? Once again, I want to highlight what I mentioned at the beginning is that the open source tools are developed in such a way so that way they're very flexible and you can do anything, look at all the pieces of the code and do all the research that you want on it, right? But what the Juliusin model optimizer is all about is, you know, give me one function that you think is going to work that has all the heuristics baked into it that tries everything that's possible, you know, set up on a cloud compute system to automatically parallelize it, right? You know, Juliusin model optimizer is about doing, trying to do it the right way the first time um, without, without having to fuss about any performance details and making it as automated as possible. So, th so this is really what, what we offer there. And the next module is in the Juliusin's controls module, which uh, we actually recently had a webinar about that Frederick did. Um, so if you want to know a lot more about this, I would say check out Frederick's webinar. Um, and it's all about doing linearized controls analysis with things like uh, PID controllers and um, and and uh, being able to do things like train model-based controllers or model predictive controllers. So uh, one of the things I want to highlight here is that the Julius Sim controls module, along with all the other modules, they all compose in their functionality. So for example, the model predictive controls uh, mechanism allows one to build, uh, you know, build different architectures for how one would do the model bit predictive control. Now, for example, if you want to put, if you want to put that model predictive control into practice. Um, you might want to accelerate it. And so you can use, after building this model predictive control, you can, for example, uh, you know, train a surrogate on that model with the model predictive control to be able to accelerate it for, uh, for other use cases. And you know, if you want to mix model predictive control with nonlinear optimal control, well, you can build an MPC and then optimize parameters using the Julius and model optimizer. So all of these modules do work together in different workflows in different ways. At the end, I'll go through a chart that kind of shows how different individuals are using these four, four workflows. Um, but I, you know, I really want to highlight that you know you can think about it as Julius Sim has a controls module, but it's much more than that. It has a controls module and a surrogates module, but the surrogates module and the controls module are all able to work together by, by design. Um, Last but, uh, but not least, we have the Julius and Code Piler, which is all about tar targeting code for embedded hardware. Um, so for, for embedded hardware that has LLVM backends, which tends to be most embedded devices uh, these days, um, we have tools that we are developing for generating code for those devices. So for example, you know, after doing the, the model predictive control and generating a surrogate of your, of your MPC, if you want to put this onto an actual device to be able to use that in, in, in a environment, well, we have a module, an upcoming module um, that is uh, that will be generating this this code for that device. And so um, if you're we, we have a, a, a list of devices that we're targeting or a list of, of operating systems that we're targeting. But if you're really interested in this functionality, please come talk to us about um, what kinds of chips and embedded devices you're, you are interested in so that we, we can know to, to have that within our target list. Um, let me uh, let me let me dig into uh, the model optimizer. So you know, I want to do a bit of a deep dive now into the model optimizer and and what kinds of functionalities we've demonstrated with these methodologies. So uh, just to, to, to reiterate, right, the mo Julius Sim model optimizer is the module of Julius Sim, which is all about mixing model with data and trying to find, you know, how you should be changing model parameters or change the model design, you know, the, the equations itself, such that you can, you know, have a more predictive model, right? Have your model predict the, the data better. 
Um, one of the big use cases of the Julius of Model Optimizer so far has been within the pharmaceutical industry. You know, this is this is a case where people build these complex models of you know human uh, complex models of human interaction um, and complex models of drug drug uh, drug interactions with enzymes and all these in, uh, all these pieces. And what we what we demonstrated is that the you know the Julius and Model Optimizer is able to effectively figure out what how one should be you know choosing the parameters of these very difficult models in, uh, to be able to match multiple data sets from from um, from clinical trials. So one one uh, piece to highlight, which we got an award for a, a bit a bit back, was for. Uh, the acceleration of, of uh, calculating um, and fitting models for cardiac steady state calculations. Um, this was done in tandem with, with Pfizer. You can find more details at the ACOP twenty at the ACOP twenty twenty uh, uh, paper, which is all about um, this result. And basically, what we're able to show is that we're able to get about a um, a hundred and twenty times acceleration um, against the original MATLAB code that was that was being used for this at uh, at, at, at the at the company and in in the department. Um, we also showed that on a different model, a model which this will actually be uh, in, a, as a, in a peer reviewed study uh, fairly soon, we also showed with, with the same group that, um, that global optimization of models was able to be accelerated over a MATLAB case by 15 times, right? The, the MATLAB case was uh, not just, you know, straight MATLAB, but it was actually using the uh, MATLAB code compilation tools and mixing that with Sundial's integrators and all that, um, and using the GA from, from MATLAB. We're able to improve that by 15 times and be able to get a much faster um, semi, uh, model fitting routine that was then applied to a whole virtual population of 10,000 uh, patients. And you can then see how the, the you know, the, you can then calculate in your head how much of a huge uh, computational payoff that ends up being. Um, not only that, this was on this was the acceleration that we're able to show on just CPUs. But when we went to a GPU accelerated form, we want, got all the way up to 175x acceleration. So we're going to share more details about this in the future. Um, there is a small write up that you can find online from ACOP 2020, which is all about this. This, this the, the, uh, that was done in 2020 with what was a early version of the Julissa model optimizer, which we've now put together as a fully fledged, you know, make it easy to point and click and get these kind of results. Results. Um, another piece of the Julissa model optimizer, as I mentioned, is not just model calibration, but also the ability to um, generate and, ex and extend and autocomplete models. So I want to kind of go a little bit into the results that we've seen with the methodology. Right, so this is these results are not with the Julissa model optimizer itself, but the underlying methodology as we've seen people uh, make make use of it. So the core idea behind it is that you know if we have some prior knowledge of models, then we can make better use of our data. Right. So purely data driven machine learning requires more data than if we make use of some information. Right. It's like you know if. If, a, if an AI system already knows about general relativity, then it should be able to predict how planets are moving much better than one that you just give it data of, of different planets, right? So um, this, is what, this is this area of scientific machine learning that we have developed um, for making the, the pieces of Julia Sim really come together. And, um, and what, you know, the way that this kind of works is that if you, if you give us a, a partial model, so you give us a differential equation, here it would be a modeling toolkit model. Um, and you know that you, this model does not accurately fit the data for any parameters in, in the data set, what we can do is we can extend the model with neural networks, and then we can use that to automatically discover what could be missing from the model and give you back in a nice form um, a essentially autocomplete version, right? So we can, we can give you back uh, pieces and say, hey, these are the possible parts of your model that are missing. Here's the symbolic form. Here's the modeling toolkit components for that, which you can then go and judge or you know, go back and do uh, other studies um, to be able to figure out whether the, the, those are good models uh, of the missing physics uh, that from the, from the original specification. Um, we've shown now in many different circumstances that this model autocomplete is able to give very fairly accurate models. So, for example, um, there was a group that that took that took this methodology, um, used an encoding that that fixed uh, the idea of Newtonian mechanics into the system, um, let the model autocomplete to be able to. Uh, find what the general relativistic correction would be. Um, and this was on a case where it was looking at a 
binary black hole system. Um, and from the binary, from the geodesic or from the LIGO black hole data, so from the gravitational wave data, it was able to um, train from a small bit of data and extrapolate in the future what the geodesic equations for that binary black hole system would be. Um, the blue is the true is the true waveform, so the the true data, and the orange is what the prediction was. And you can see that just from a small amount of data, it was able to learn what the geodesic prediction would be, auto complete the model, and extend it to the future. Um, this was seen in a different case with the development of earthquake safe buildings. Um, this group made use of, of the techniques to be able to train on a small amount of data with a physical model that was somewhat inaccurate as it extrapolated to the future. But this neural network was then able to correct the inaccuracies of this model and beyond the training set be able to predict how, you know, how the model or how the, the building should react to then be able to better develop uh, buildings in a way that would be more earthquake safe. Um, we I mean, recently worked with a group that we that we're doing a lot of battery modeling with on showcasing these this technique for um, for uh, accurate modeling of battery degradation. Standard models of battery degradation are are in, basically incapable of hitting the accuracy that's required for developing better battery materials. So we worked this with this group to demonstrate that. Um, that using the, these techniques allows one to build a new battery model that is more accurate in the way that model that batteries degrade over time. To then be able to use that information to target what you know new materials that would decrease the rate of this degradation process. Um, Another use case of this model optimizer technique for, for model autocomplete is being used with the, with the collaboration that Julie Computing has with Pumas for the development of deep NLME. Um, and this is specifically for the case of trying to, def trying to automatically discover patient-specific models uh, in a clinical context to be able to predict what the, uh, what the most accurate dose would be um, for, for an individual or what the best dose would be for an individual under different clinical situations with different covariates. Um, this actually won an award as well. So the, the model optimizer methodologies have been really well tested. And really what we've done with it is we've taken this kind of loose, you know, researchy area and made it more into a point and click automated parallel cloud compute kind of environment. So that way, all these kinds of results don't require a machine learning background anymore. These are results that now can be done, you know, from the safety of a graphical user interface. So you point and click, you know, you put together a model, and now you say, "Please auto complete for me." And this is what we, this is what we're doing with Julie Sim, and you know, this is what we're doing with Julie Sim in general about taking what we, the the you know, taking a lot of what we've been working with the community and making it refined for industry applications. Um, lastly, I wanted to talk about more of this, this refinement with, uh, with the applications area. Um, and in this applications area, uh, th this is this last piece here, which is simplifications of the modeling tools and the model libraries and the modules that make it fairly easy to just, you know, point and click in a web interface, do a lot of, have a lot of functionality. So the digital twin uh, generator app, this one is scheduled to be done uh, fa fairly soon, but we, we don't have a picture of the GUI quite yet. Um, what, what it allows you to do is be able to do that digital twin generator, right? The take, you know, take uh, data and output a model, but do that in a way that is no code, right? So be able to basically you know, click buttons on a, web, on a web app and be able to generate models. So the reason for this, of course, is that you know, if, if you have some programmers in your, in your group, or if you have some application specialists in your group that are not necessarily strong programmers, this makes it so that way Julia Sim is accessible to them and they can work with the rest of your team even without any prior experience with, with, uh, with Julia. And so this can really bring experimentalists into, into this fold. Um, the FMU Accelerator app, this one has had a previous webinar, so I'd say check that out for, for all the details. What this one allows you to do is to use the surrogate generator on FMUs. So FMUs are encodings of simulations from say Simulink or Modelica. Right? So let's say you have a, a Simulink model um, that, that's running too slow and you want to get an acceleration. You can export that to an FMU. You point and click, drag this into a web app. You click a few buttons for how you want the, the surrogate to be defined and you click go and it gives you back an FMU that you can embed back into Simulink. Um, and you know, then you, and then we, when we show that this could make your simulations a lot faster, especially from that context. Um, 
And so, you know, you could do all this, all this functionality is available from the Julia Sim surrogates module, right? You can use this in a, in a co full coding fashion, and that will give you more functionality and more choices. But the Julia, uh, Julia Sim FMU Accelerator app makes it so that way if someone can do this without any prior Julia knowledge, it's just a purely point and click graphical user interface for this uh, very, what we see could be a common use case of, of, the, of the tool. Um, and one, one of these other pieces, which uh, which was highlighted in the one of these other pieces, which was highlighted in the controls webinar, is the Julia Sim PID Auto Tuner app. Where if you have a model that you want to train, if you want to build a a PID uh, controller around some operating point, you can bring it into this uh, into this app, um, and then you can very visually move sliders around to be able to tune the PID uh, components to be able to hit the properties that you want, right? You know, be able to tune the the difference of sensitivity um, to the the reaction speed and, and all that for for these types of controllers, right? Of course, you can do this in, in, in code as well, but this makes it so that way you can very visually uh, build the PID controller that's appropriate for your application. And last but not least is the extra solver. So um, one of the one of the key uh, little bits that I want to end with here is that Julia Sim has uh, special solvers that is shipping with. These are solvers um, that are that have a different licensing from the open source ones. Um, they're developed in such a way that any of the uh, models that you already have, say for example, for a modeling toolkit or differential equations at JL, they'll target the same format. Um, so you're, they're ready to be used on anything that you've written for the open source libraries, but they have new special algorithms that, uh, that can accelerate for specific scenarios. Um, so one of these algorithms is disco diff EQ, which is a discontinuity aware di differential algebraic equation solver, which can essentially discover where you have discontinuities in your equation, uh, implicitly defined uh, discontinuities, and use that to be able to control the stepping in a much more accurate manner. Um, this, this, this figure does not do as much justice for how poorly uh, a uh, BDF method does on this example equation, where there, there's a kink in the equation, there's a discontinuity, which then causes the BDF integrator to, well, it steps near it, it steps above it, it actually takes about 30 steps to be able to, to resolve this discontinuity, whereas the di uh, delay di or the disco dip EQ method is able to directly step to the discontinuity and step uh, and step. Uh, beyond it then, right? And so the, these, this type of method is enabled to improve the numerical stability, the numerical robustness, the convergence speed, but also this, the efficiency of the simulation by directly understanding where the discontinuities are. Um, this has been developed in tandem with the HVAC library because HVAC, uh, HVAC is a area where we know that there's a lot of implicit discontinuities, for example, due to phase changes that happen in refrigerant properties as you are using the, the refrigerant. Um, and so this is a special type of integrator that can really help these kinds of applications. Uh, Sudo transient is a accelerated nonlinear solver. And so if you're really interested in finding steady state behaviors, this is a new algorithm for these steady state behaviors. And I can go into details in the algorithm, um, but it has a lot of tweaks that you would not find in any of the ones that are out there on, um, in, in the open source ecosystem. And last but not least, there is a new BDF that is uh, a very special one. I, I can't go into detail about exactly how it's doing it, but it's missing a lot of symbolic techniques into the numerics to be able to accelerate it as well. And so there's three different uh, solvers that we also give you with Julia Sim that improve the speed at which certain models are able to be handled. Um, and now let me go into to, to ending this with uh, looking at perspective workflows, right? So, um, you know, for example, let's say you're an HVAC engineer and you're interested in using Julia Sim. Um, the, this is this is a workflow diagram for how the pieces all to come together, right? So we would expect a, a, a if 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 you're a HVAC engineer and you want to be using the Julia Sim tools, right? You can actually get started today. Um, even you know even before chatting with us, you can just pick up modeling toolkit and just start building an A causal model. You can do that in, uh, right now or you know five minutes after this uh, this webinar. Now, if you don't want to build the whole model from scratch, you can use the Julia Sim HVAC model to have this pre built components. And then you mix that with the models that you've developed. So let's say you you want to build a, a you want to have a model of a building. Um, you can you can take the uh, Julia Sim HVAC model, 
uh, to be able to have these HVAC components, and then you can compose that with the model, the building, to be able to now have a model, right? And then once you have your model of the system that you're trying to understand, well, the first, you know, you maybe you want to do model calibration, or you want to uh, build a model predictive controller for this system, right? Uh, the first thing that you might want to do, though, is make use of the surrogate trainer to accelerate your simulations of this model, right? Remember, the surrogate trainer is the machine learning component that builds accelerated versions of the model, but it composes then with the other tools. So you can build the surrogate uh, of, the, of your original model and then use the surrogate, you know, this faster version with the model optimizer to then ask the question of, oh, am I missing any possible physics here, right? And auto-complete the model. And you can then do, do this loop a few times until you have done, you know, you can do this loop a few times to further refine the model that you have. And once your model is refined, um, you can you can say, well, I have this real world data and I want to make my model match the data. The Juliusim model optimizer then allows you to do a global optimization against that data and be able to find the parameters of, of your model system uh, that would most accurately calibrate it to data, but also do this in a uh, in a uncertain quantified way. So it would give you a whole point cloud of potential solutions. So that way you can then run predictive scenarios for all the different found uh, uh, all the different found uh, optima. Now, once you have a, a, a calibrated model, you're, you're good to go, right? You're able to now use that to be able, in, in, in a predictive modeling scenario, to be able to discover how you should, you know, act on the equation. You know, for example, then you can add electronic specification for a uh, for some microchip that you want to use in, in the controls mechanism. Uh, you can build a model predictive control using the Julie Sims controls. And once you have all that put together, you can use the you can use the code piler to be able to generate code for the embedded device. So that way this optimized controller can actually be put into use on the real world air conditioning system out there in the world. Right. So all of these pieces really come together. So that way, you know, it starts from you know building models, but it ends with putting these models to use in real world scenarios. Um, we, we, you know, and, and let's say you're your electrical vehicle engineer, um, one, one, you know, you might have models that already exist. So for example, you might have models from Modelica. Um, we can start, you know, we can start with models from there as well. Right? Remember the FMU accelerator. We can take a Dymola, an FMU from Dymola as our input or, or one of these pet lion models or, you know, all these different kinds of models from, from these different uh, systems. And we can then read them in using the FMU, the Juliusin FMU reader. And that actually makes them be components within the modeling toolkit world, right? So we can directly import these models that can be FMU re represented. Juliusin allows you to put them as um, tools within the modeling toolkit universe. So that way you can now combine them with any other modeling toolkit model that's been developed. Um, and of course, since we can target any modeling toolkit type of model, we can uh, generate circuits of this. So you, know, you can take a battery model, um, and you can take a battery model and an engine model from from FMU, uh, from FMU as a Dymola, and you can now run the, the Julius Sim circuit trainer on that, so that way this co-simulation system runs more uh, a lot faster, and then use the, that accelerated co-simulation system um, to, for example, calibrate the, the parameters of the model against data using the model optimizer, and then generate controllers for this whole this for this coupled system, right? And so this really makes it so that way you can scale from you know looking at mo models of specific components to models of the whole combined system, um, accelerate the whole combined system with AI tools, and then be able to do optimization of controls with all of the model pieces to together. This makes it so that way, of course, you can have a more accurate model of the system in, in, in its operating conditions and be able to then um, make it so that way it's more accurate in the real world scenario the, for the first uh, development, for the first deployment. Um, and similarly to, to the to the Dymola starting case, right, we can also start with uh, with Simulink models. Simulink has a way to be able to export its models into an FMU Acceler uh, representation. You can drag and drop that into the FMU Accelerator app, which will then generate a neural network equivalent to this, uh, to this FMU, and it'll be able to export it as an FMU itself that can then be imported back into Simulink for you know, accelerating that model. So there's many different ways to make use of the tools of Julia Sim. 
right? You can start, you can be building models yourself, building these models in Julia or, or have models that we give you, or you can import models through the FMU system. Um, so you can do co-simulation uh, using models that were previously developed in Modelica or previously developed in Simulink. Uh, Julia Sim really works with a lot of these different aspects because we know that a lot of companies have a lot of these models already developed in, in previous systems. Um, so yeah, I think that, that that covers a lot of what, what I want to discuss. Um, you know, so Julia Sim is all about accelerating scientific discovery through a composable machine learning guide, guided uh, modeling and simulation system that has all the tools to make you know, cloud compute, parallelism, um, all, and all of these things very clear, obvious, and easy to use for people who want to use this to solve real world problems and not have to fuss with the tools. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to go now through some of the questions. Um, I think the first one was uh, was answered by by Naz, but I'll I'll, I'll, I'll highlight this. Um, so there's a question that was talked about the speed ups offered by Julia Sim over MATLAB and, and Sundials. Um, does this take into account uh, compilation? Uh, yes, actually, that result takes into account compilation because um, we're talking about a global optimization. Um, so for example, this was a 15, uh, 15 times acceleration on a global optimization. Uh, it, take, it takes about 15.5 hours, if I remember correctly, to do the global optimization for the original MATLAB code. It's about one hour for the Julia code. The, the, the pre-compilation for this case takes about 20 seconds or 30 seconds. And so, yes, this includes compilation, but you know, for these very large scale models and these very large scale optimization, compilation just is a, a non-factor, right? You know, it's, it's 20 seconds out of an hour or, or, you know, in comparing to something that was originally 15, uh, 15 hours. Um, we are still working on improving startup times and, and pieces like that. We know that is something that is very good to, you know, for improving the user experience, but for these very large scale cases with, you know, very large compute and everything, um, this is, uh, you know, the, we, we find that the compilation is already much, you know, very, very, very uh, un, uh, overshadowed by the actual run times. Um, you know, what is the size of the ODE that this tool has been tested on? Uh, with hundreds to thousands of equations. Uh, one of the cases that I mentioned is 100,000 equations. We have a test case that we're working on that's a million equations. Um, and so, you know, it's from one to a million so far. That's been our test cases. Um, of course, we're trying to push that more and more. And so if you have, uh, if you have cases that you're interested in, we can definitely do a pilot engagement and showcase uh, how this, uh, the scaling of this um, and how that interacts with the cloud compute and such. Um, so uh, let's see, can Julia Sim be used with a discrete event simulation, uh, combinatorial optimization process? No, there is not an, uh, it, there's not a, at this time, an import for discrete event simulation, though we are actually working on some other alternative inputs for modeling toolkit. When modeling toolkit supports discrete event simulation, then it'll be able to be used with this whole infrastructure. So I'll keep that in mind uh, now that I've seen this, this, this uh, here. Um, in fact, if you wanna follow up, if you can send me more information on the types of models that you're interested in, um, that could be very useful for building our future roadmap. So, you know, please get in touch if that's what you're interested in. Um, and so, our next question is, what kind of data does the nonlinear mix effects tool Puma support? Um, so Pumas is, is a bit different. So Pumas is focused on the clinical pharmacology. Um, this is all focused on, so, so the, the, the Julia Sim model optimizer or, uh, has been, has done, has been used effectively a lot in preclinical pharmacology, right, in the quantitative systems of pharmacology domain, and also in PBBK, so for, uh, for uh, you know, physiologically based uh, pharmacokinetics. Um, but if you need a nonlinear mixed effects modeling tool, that is Pumas, which is a separate tool from this. Right. It's another one of these tools that's very similar and very related to, to, to Julia Sim, but it, uh, the, the, the specifically the nonlinear mixed effects models is, is a separate component. Um, and so there's, there's, if, if you want to have more information on that, um, that's a separate webinar and with more information. Um, if, if, you, if you don't know the, 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 the links for that, um, if you, you can email me and I can send you and get, get you in touch with the right people there. Um, I will say uh, what inference uh, methods does it implement? SAEM. It does have a lot of tools. Uh, does have a lot of methods like SAEM. Um, I can actually pull pull this up here. Um, and so uh, let's see. Yes, uh, the, the SAEM inside of Pumas is a very um, is a very well accelerated one. I can say 
Um, it's developed by one, uh, it was developed in tandem with one of our engineers who develops a lot of our BLAS tools. And so um, when we look at simulations against a, a, a tool like non-mem, uh, we can actually see a, about a hundred, a hundred or so, 150 or so acceleration uh, with our SAEM tools against that. So, I mean, so Pumas is a different conversation, so I'll, I'll cut that here, but I will say it has methods for FOCE, you know, Laplace I, but also uh, Bayesian, uh, Bayesian estimation and, um, and SAEM, and you can, and it does get pretty strong uh, accelerations against tools like non-MEM, but we'll, I'll cut that for, for another time. Um, can you please go again into the earthquake slide and explain how it makes the model better? Yeah, so let me let me uh, let me pull that up here. Yeah, so so um, what what you see in this model is that you know so in in both the case of the physical model and. Uh, in the physical model case, right, what was done is on some training data set, the physical model was calibrated against the, the data, and then it was extrapolated forward in time. But what you can see is that the, these dotted points, these dotted lines, are the are these dotted lines are the prediction of what the physical model believes the the future evolution of the system would be, um, and you can see that it drifts over time, right? Essentially, it's able to calibrate to match the model correctly in on on the training data set, but uh, the model is, is has some inaccuracies, and so if you begin to predict in the future what what should happen given this model, um, it's not as accurate. The you know so that's the dotted lines. The the dashed lines of the deeper dashed lines is the case where this this extension with a with a neural network was looked at, um, and this you can see it, once you've matched the training data set here, it's able to extrapolate much more accurately. Um, of course, um, you know this is real world data, and so it's not you know one hundred percent accuracy. There is an error associated with this, but it's at least able to demonstrate that it finds a much more uh, much more predictive model. Um, and see, and it shows this in in a few different cases. This is actually a peer reviewed study. So if you want to go take a look at it, um, feel free to, to pick up that, that paper. Um, I'll say that th this is with the, the methodology, or this is with the underlying tools that the Julie Sim model optimizers developed on. And so this is with a, a bit more of, of hand tuning, um, whereas the Julie Sim model optimizer will get, it gets similar, to, you know, gets two similar results using a fully heuristic approach that does not require the, the tuning of the open source piece. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see. I think that that is most of the questions. Was there any other questions that someone received in, in chat here? Uh, Chris, I have one question here. Um, so if someone is working, uh, someone is asking if they are working in a different domain um, whose models are not supported with um, what we currently offer right now, um, is there a vision for our partnership in the future to help integrate it? Yes, yeah, yeah. Um, so definitely. So you know, we, we the reason why we focus so far on HVAC models, battery models, circuit models, and rigid body dynamics is because these are the groups that we have gotten in contact with, right? You know, we're working with HVAC uh, developers, we're working with uh, people in the electrical vehicle industry, and so these are the these are the models that we've targeted early. Um, but our roadmap is flexible, right? So if you if you are interested in Julia Sim and what you would need to get started with Julia Sim is you would need some kind of pre built model. Model to get there, uh, please come talk to us. I mean, we, we are very interested in hearing what you would need, and we can definitely try to, to see what would, you know, how we can work with you to be able to build the models that you would need. Well, I think we're just about out of time. So I think. It's it's about time for us to wrap it up. Unless you have anything else you'd like to address, Dr. Rakakis. Um, I think that's about it. Yeah, I looks like it hit almost precisely on the time, so I'm happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys so much for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for having me.